All right, well at this time let me invite you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 22, our scripture passage for our study for Good Friday. Luke chapter 22. So this evening we're going to be looking at the prayer that Jesus gave in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Luke records it here with a few extra details that I want to focus on for our study tonight. And I want to give my greetings uh, to those at New Haven, uh, uh, members of New Haven, uh, listening to this and watching it in your home. Once again, another week is rolling by where unfortunately we are unable to gather together. Um, but yet, we praise God that through this means of technology, yet His Word goes forth. And so we once again look to Him to bless His Word in our homes. So Luke 22, and we're going to be looking at verses 39 through 46 for our study tonight. Let us give our attention now to God's holy word. Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. There ends the reading of God's holy word. Would you join me now in a moment of prayer? Indeed, our God and our Father, as we come to this night to contemplate once again the sacrifice of your Son on our behalf, Father, we pray that you would bless us through the hearing of your word tonight. Father, especially now as we contemplate his request and this prayer that so long ago was uttered in agony in the garden. Father, we pray, send your Spirit now upon us. We pray, Lord, that your word would come forth with all clarity and truth. We pray that the Holy Spirit now would richly impart it into our hearts. We ask, O oh Lord, tonight that you would stir our affections for the Lord. And Father, that you would use this recorded audio to spread your word. We pray, Lord, that it would bring forth conversions, that it would strengthen faith. And so, Father, be pleased now to be present among us. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, when I was uh, a little kid, I remember uh, being dropped off at my grandmother's house one day uh, for her to babysit us. I don't remember all of the, the details that surrounded this, but I do remember that while I was pr playing in the basement, the phone rang. And of course, back in those days, we had things called landlines. And so uh, there was a phone upstairs and there was a phone downstairs. And so I thought it would be fun uh, to listen in on the conversation downstairs. And uh, so I quietly picked up the telephone and I was able to hear uh, my grandmother uh, talk with her friend. Now, I don't remember all the details of that phone conversation. I do remember hearing the voice on the other end. And I do remember getting caught by my grandmother as I quietly as I could hung up the phone at the end. But I was able to listen in to the phone conversation, and you can learn quite a bit uh, as you just quietly listen in. Well, tonight, that's exactly what I want to do with you from this passage. I want to listen in on a conversation that our Savior has with his Father as he prays to him on the night of his betrayal. Uh, we want to listen into this prayer, and as we listen into it, the, what we actually over here explains the gospel to us. As we listen in to Jesus and his request to the Father, we, we learn of the agony of the night that is before our Savior. In fact, as we listen in, it reveals to us really the request that is the gospel, 
that this cup of wrath would pass from Christ so that he would not have to drink it. And you see, as we listen in tonight, we learn really what the cross is all about. Tonight, we come to celebrate what is known as Good Friday. Good Friday really is the darkest day as Christ literally goes to the cross later on. Uh, he goes at the hands of his own people. He goes because of the betrayal of a close friend. And he goes to not just die physically, but really what we hear from this conversation is that he's going to die in anguish of hellish wrath for the sins of his people. Now, as we come to this prayer, we jump right in the middle of the context of this night. Uh, already now the flow of the narrative has us, after Satan has entered Judas' heart to betray Jesus, uh, Jesus has already instituted the Lord's Supper, and uh, he also, just previously to this account, has warned the disciples uh, that Satan will sift them. He has sought to tempt them. And so tonight as he goes to the garden, all of these things are on the hearts and the minds of his disciples. So here's our theme for tonight. We learn that Jesus' prayer reveals the horror of hell in contemplating the wrath on the cross. Jesus' prayer reveals the horror of hell in contemplating the wrath on the, cr the cross. I want to look at three things with you about this prayer. First of all, we need to note the prayer in agony. The prayer in agony, and that's where we want to spend most of our time looking at this difficult request. And secondly, though, we want to look at the pain in agony. We get a physical or a glimpse at the physical agony of our Savior. And then thirdly and briefly, we want to look at the persistence in agony. How our Savior persisted all alone in this trial. So, first of all then, look with me at the prayer in agony. And the first thing that Luke now opens up for us is the location of this prayer. Now look at verses 39 through 40. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. And so Luke now continues his story, and he tells us, that Jesus goes to his usual place of prayer, uh, listed here as the Mount of Olives. Uh, the other gospel writers piece this together, together for us. This is an olive grove, and uh, the Gospel of Mark tells us that this is Gethsemane. And uh, Luke here shows us that Jesus goes here as his usual pattern. Uh, kind of as a side note that's instructive for us. Uh, this shows us that Jesus is willingly going to the cross. Jesus goes to the place that he knows, Judas knows, where he will find him. And so we see in this act of going to the Mount of Olives, Jesus goes where his traitor will find him. Now as we get there, notice Jesus begins to address his disciples. He commands them to go to prayer and prayer for themselves to pray that they would not fall into temptation. It's not entirely clear what temptation Jesus is referring to here. Some think that it's the temptation not to fall asleep. I would point actually to verses 31 and 32. I think this gets at more at what Jesus is getting at. In verse 31, Jesus inform, informed both Peter and the other disciples that Satan has already asked to test them. Uh, likely the test is to fall away completely or to reject Christ completely. And in verse 32, Jesus tells Simon that he has prayed for Simon and that when he is strengthened, uh, he is to, or when he returns, he is to strengthen the rest of the brothers. And so all this is in mind to set the scene. Uh, Jesus has come to be taken away. And as he comes, he shows care for his disciples. Now, this is the main point we need to look at tonight. Look at the request of Jesus. That's in verses 41 and 42. We read there, He withdrew a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
We see here that Jesus now withdraws from the other disciples. We learn from the other Gospels that he actually takes Peter, James, and John a little closer than he withdraws even from them. Uh, presumably he gets distance so that he has a little privacy with his father. They're close enough to watch, they're close enough to overhear, but yet he's all alone so that he has privacy with his father to pour out his heart. Now the first thing we need to deal with tonight is notice the first thing about the request deals with a cup. Jesus requests from his father that this cup be removed from him. In other words, Jesus is asking the Father that he not drink of this cup that the Father has in store for him. Now the question needs to be asked, what is this cup that Jesus is referring to? And I think even more importantly tonight, the question needs to be asked, what's in this cup that Jesus is asking that he not drink? And here's the answer to that question. The answer is, this cup stands for the just wrath of a holy God against the sin of unbelievers. In other words, when Jesus refers to this cup filled with wrath, he's referring to this biblical theme that is found throughout Scripture where, where God describes his wrath through an outpouring of a cup. Now let me read for you three passages which get at this. There are many more, but I think these three get at what Jesus means here. First of all, Psalm 75 verse 8 says this, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed. He pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. In other words, Psalm 75 gets at the reality that, that God being a holy God looks down upon the wicked and he will pour out this cup of foaming wine, his cup of wrath. And, and when that time comes, what the psalm is driving home is that the wicked of the nations will drink it down to its dregs. Next passage, consider Jeremiah 25 verse 15. Jeremiah writes, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. And lastly, looking ahead, John in Revelation 14 notes his following in verses 9 through 10. Quoting here, And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so that gets at what Jesus here is requesting be removed from him. When Jesus is praying that this cup be removed from him, Jesus is looking ahead to the events of the day before him. He is looking to the events on the cross, and Jesus sees what's going to happen in the darkness of Calvary. And Jesus now looks in prayer to his Father in heaven, and he asks that the Father, if it be his will, remove this cup of wrath from him. In other words, Jesus is acknowledging that, that what the Father has sent him to do was literally to drink the full cup of his wrath for his people. In other words, to get more at the imagery, Jesus is to absorb completely, to exhaust completely all of God's just wrath that has been stored up against his own people. And he is to literally drink it in their place. And he trembles at the thought. Now the other part about the request that we need to look at, it not only is he asking for the cup be removed, but notice, if the Father is willing. He asks that the Father, if you are willing, take this cup. In other words, Jesus is acknowledging that, that the drinking of this cup of wrath is the Father's will, that that it is the Father's will that he stand in place of his people. 
In other words, it is the Father's will to redeem a beloved people for himself. And what is Jesus getting at here? What Jesus is literally doing is his, he's pleading with the Father that if there is another way to redeem his people, let that be the path going forward. What Jesus is pleading with the Father is is if there possibly could be another way, another way where he would not have to drink this cup of wrath, let that be the Father's will to go forward. And so he prays that this cup be removed, and then he prays that the Father, if the Father is willing. Now this gets a little difficult to comprehend, but what is going on here is that Christ in his human nature is expressing the full horror of the payment of the cross. In other words, Christ in his human nature is looking ahead and gazing at what he's about to do, and his human nature trembles at the thought of what he is about to endure on Calvary. And so he is rightly crying out to his loving Father to see if there possibly could be another way. He is rightly crying out as a sinless man dreading the thought of being forsaken by his loving Father. Now, the last thing we need to note about this prayer now is the submission that Christ has. Look again at verse 42, the second half. Before he literally ends the sentence, notice that he immediately submits himself to the Father's will. He says, yet not my will, but yours be done. Immediately, Christ, in his Human nature humbles himself in full acknowledgement that that if this be the Father's will, he willingly accepts it. He willingly walks forward. He expresses his full obedience to the Father's will. I think that's important to note as well. It's instructive for us. Jesus in his human nature is submitting himself to the full will of the Father with absolute submission to what the Father has for him. If you think about that in the scope of all of Scripture, this is Christ, the second Adam, doing what the first Adam failed to do. Be reminded, Jesus at this moment is in the garden of his own, a garden of agony. The first Adam was in the garden of Eden. And when the Father told him not to eat of the fruit, Adam, the first Adam, forsook the Father's will. He went his own way. But now the second Adam has come to his garden, and he is submitting to perfectly to the Father's will. And so here's the point tonight. Jesus trembles under the thought of divine wrath and judgment, but yet he obeys. He willingly goes in obedience to the Father's will to deliver his people. Now you would ask at this point, what's the main point? What, what are we getting at? And, and, I, and I would point out tonight that this is the main point. We learn from this that there is no other way for God to redeem his people. Just think about that for a moment. Jesus looks to his Father in heaven and he he asks, Father, if, if there's any other way, let that be your will. And he hears silence. There is no other way. Christ hears the response, as it were, that there is no other way for the Father's will to redeem a people to actually go forth. Someone must stand in the gap. Someone must pay the price. There is no redemption except Christ walk the path that the Father has set forth for him. There's no other way for the Father's gift of love to be accepted except through the Son giving of himself in their place. So that is the prayer of agony for our Savior. Now, notice secondly tonight, The pain in agony. Luke, being the good physician that he does, he notes a couple of details about Christ that other gospel writers do not note. And notice the physical agony being described here, and there are three descriptions that get at the absolute pain that Christ is feeling in the moment. A first part of the pain is that he needs to be strengthened by an angel. Look at verse 43. It says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. In other words, the father heard the prayer and his answer was, no, there is no other way. But the father now sends an angel and this angel angel comes down to minister uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, we're not told here how the angel strengthened our Savior. Uh, Perhaps the angel reminded Christ of the people for whom Christ loved and for whom he was going to the cross for. Uh, Perhaps the angel reminded Christ of his Father's love for him and his care for him even to the end. But whatever the case, notice this. Our Savior in his human nature now bearing under the weight of the pain of agony needs a messenger from heaven to come and strengthen him. And this angel comes to strengthen him, to bolster him for the moment of being forsaken on the cross. Now, secondly, about the pain of agony. Notice that this drives him to earnest, earnesty in prayer. Verse 44, Luke says, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. It's interesting that that realizing the answer to his prayer or the response to his prayer was silence. There there was no other way. And and the anguish that he's feeling, notice, it's it's striking, isn't it? That the pain that he is enduring drives him to pray more ardently. Knowing the answer pushes him further into fellowship and communion with the Father. Now, as I thought about that this past week, it stood out to me because how unlike our own temptation, isn't it? If you think to our temptation when we are in the midst of a trial, when we are praying for something, think of times perhaps in your own walk when when you've been asking in prayer and, and God seems to not be listening. Or maybe those times in your prayer where it seems as God's answer is just a little bit more that I'm going to ask of you to endure. Isn't it true that our temptation is to give up prayer altogether? Our temptation is to to feel in despair that God's not listening to me, to feel that God must not care about me. And so the temptation that that we feel is to to quit praying altogether because it doesn't seem to be working. And yet that's not the response of Christ. When Christ is in this moment of agony, when when it seems as it's obvious that, that the Father is telling him that he must go forward, notice his response is to pray all the more. It says that where Jesus is saying, I'm going to be rejected by you later on. I just want to be near you for just a little bit longer. I want to pray. I want to fellowship. I want to commune with you just a little bit more. And so we see here that the pain of agony drives Christ in persistence to the throne of his Father in heaven. And lastly, and this is probably most notably what stood out to us in the text, notice the pain of Christ is seen physically. Look at verse 44. It goes on to say, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Luke now records that as Christ began to pray, as he he felt the anguish coming in on him, as he, he realized that he must go forward, he became physically overtaken with a horror of what he knew was coming, that physically he began to sweat, as it were, drops of blood. Now, it's interesting, there's a debate what Luke means by this. You can read it of one of two ways here. Luke could mean here that Jesus literally began to sweat drops of blood. Uh, The commentaries I referred to this past week noted that there have been times where this has been recorded, where a person can be in such torment and such anguish that the blood vessels in your skin and your sweat glands could actually rupture. And as you begin to sweat, it mixes with the blood and it appears that you are literally sweating blood. That is very possibly what Christ is experiencing. However, equally could be possible that Luke is drawing a, a picture imagery here, that as Jesus began to sweat that night, he was sweating at such a rate, it looked as if he were bleeding out of a wound, that it was just pouring as if blood were coming out of him. But either way, notice what Luke's point is. Jesus physically is becoming overwhelmed with the thought of drinking the cup. And as well, just be reminded, later on, it's going to be told to us that this was a cold night. Peter is going to need to warm himself by a fire. And so as the temperature drops, Christ actually begins to sweat. All of this has built up to this moment where now Christ becomes physically overwhelmed at what he is about to endure. So what's the point tonight? 
Well, believer, let us not go one step further without realizing, without acknowledging at this moment what is taking place. Well, Luke is recording what took place in that garden that night is physical torment upon our Savior for us. Don't miss that. Luke records all of these details, not so we could just gaze upon what happened to Christ, but is to draw us in as we listen into this prayer, as we gaze upon what happened to Christ. Don't miss that Christ is doing this for you, believer. The anguish that is gripping his heart is gripping him because he must walk this path in order to redeem a people that he was sent for. Listen, just think about what would happen if Christ were to walk away. If in this moment of agony, Christ were to think of himself, to, to get up and to consider it too much and walk away, the reality tonight, believers, this, you and I would drink this cup for all eternity. If Christ were to leave this garden and run from this path, if he were to reject the Father's will, believer, be reminded that that would seal certain eternal doom for you and me. If Christ does not go forward, we have no hope tonight. And yet, and yet, notice the persistence of our Savior. Notice thirdly, as we close out this passage, that, that Christ does not walk away. Christ does not give up. But notice the end of this passage. We see a persistence in the middle of agony. Look at verse 45. It says here that when he arose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. In other words, we see that our Savior persists alone in this agony. That as Christ is feeling the weight, as Christ is enduring the torment, his disciples have fallen asleep. While Jesus is in full agony, his disciples are not standing watch with him. Now, Luke does record that the reason that they have fallen asleep is that it's due to sorrow. They, they have become so overwhelmed with what's going on, overwhelmed with this scene that, that they have fallen asleep. But notice, they could not handle staying awake with him. The disciples could not handle praying with their master in the midst of his agony. And, and I would even say it this way. The disciples could not even handle the duration of time to even pray for their own needs. So weak is the flesh, so weak is our endurance that, that we, like the disciples, need to be re reminded tonight that we are unable to endure, but we, like the disciples, cannot stand. And so tonight we see that Christ persists alone in walking this path. He persists by himself. He will bear up entirely all alone under the wrath and the suffering that he goes to. And lastly, notice that he persists in love for his people. Look at verse 46. He says, Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Isn't it striking that Jesus, when he wakes them up, points them back to their own need? You know, if it were me at this moment, I would begin rebuking them. Get up. Don't you see what I'm going through? And that's not what Christ does. Notice that he persists in love. He looks upon them. He looks upon their need. He looks upon the temptation they're about to enter into. And instead of directing attention to what he's going through, he immediately directs their attention to their own prayer. He wakes them and he comments on their need. Here's the point tonight. Don't miss that Jesus persists alone in the path on our behalf. We're reminded one more time tonight that we contribute absolutely nothing to our salvation. We're reminded in this scene in the garden that as Christ is all alone, we're reminded the reality of the gospel is that he must go it alone. That we, like the disciples, do not walk. We add nothing. We contribute nothing. That Christ must drink this cup all alone. And beloved, be reminded one more time the reason why Christ had to be the God-man. He had to be both fully God and fully man because his infinite divine nature was necessary to uphold his human nature in this moment. In this garden, we see 
the necessary work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, preparing to bear up under the wrath of God for our sin. Now, in conclusion tonight, then, as we celebrate Good Friday, as we once again are reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we think on the gospel, what are we to make out of this? Two things tonight. First of all, does this passage not teach us about God's just wrath? We are reminded once again from Scripture that God's wrath is something to be feared. Tonight, as we come to this passage, we, we see that Jesus understood what hellish agony he was about to endure on the cross. And it should stand out to us tonight that as Christ gazed upon what hellish agony he was going to endure on the cross, it caused him such physical and spiritual torment that he needed to be strengthened by an angel. Jesus knew what it was going to be to bear up under God's just wrath. In other words, we learn tonight that God is a holy God. The Bible is undeniably clear. God is a holy God. He is a God of perfect justice. He is a God of perfect holiness. And He is a God who will justly punish every single sin. He is a holy God. He must punish sin. He must bring just wrath upon all sin. And since God is a good God, he must punish. And therefore, we see the reality that to come before our God, the God of the Bible, comes before a God who is a God of justice. Now, even to say that in our modern culture is to say something that is so unpopular. In fact, isn't it true that, that many evangelicals will try to water this down to try to avoid it? it it's, it's not comfortable, is it? To describe God our Father is a God who is so filled with wrath that his very own son trembles at the thought of bearing up under it. In fact, if you listen to many today, they will tell you that God is not angry with your sin. Well, do not tell that to Jesus this night in the garden. He knows very well God is angry with sin. And many will tell you today that God does not cast people into hell. Well, again, I would tell you to tell that to Jesus this night in the garden. Jesus knew very well the character of his Father in heaven. Here is the point tonight. The Bible is emphatically clear that God is a God of perfect holiness who punishes all sin. And tonight, in the hearing of this message, be reminded there are only one of two options for every human being who has ever lived. Option one, either, either God has dealt with your sin upon the cross and Christ has drunken the cup of the Father's wrath for you on your behalf. Or listen very carefully, you will stand before God and you will drink this cup on your own. And so tonight as we come to this passage, one very important question needs to be personally asked and answered by you. Who has dealt with your sin? Has your sin been absorbed by the Son? Has, has God in His mercy opened up your heart so that you saw the horror of your sin, that you repented of your sin? Have you cried out to forgiveness or for forgiveness for your sin? Has the Father been merciful to you to open up and reveal to you your guilt and your misery? Well, tonight, if you have, celebrate the good news of the gospel. Because the passage shows here that for every believer, we are reminded that that cup is empty. That what Christ did on the cross was to drink the full cup of the Father's wrath completely. There is no more wrath for his people. But the warning also needs to be sounded. That if you do reject this Savior, if you do reject his offer, Make no mistake about it. You will drink the cup all on your own. Our God is a just God. Hear his offer of grace tonight. The reason we call this Good Friday is because our Savior has done this on our behalf. Do not spurn this offer of grace. Christ has done it on behalf of his people. So there's a warning and there's assurance. Secondly, we also need to be reminded tonight as believers, this teaches us the deep, deep love of Jesus, does it not? 
Believer, as you go tonight, as you think on what we've noted here, as you listen to this prayer, be reminded that as you listen into the agony of the garden, it was agony done on your behalf. You see, Luke records this, and the other gospel writers record this, because we need to be reminded tonight that all of this was done because of the love that the Father and the Son had for us. Just in this passage alone, we saw here the Father's love was for us as he sent his Son to the cross. And be reminded, it was the Son's love for you, believer, that he persisted under such a reality. And you see, that is why this is Good Friday. It is good because the bad news was so bad. When we come to this passage, we realize that that, that was due us, and yet, and yet, Christ stood in the gap. And for the believer, the love of Christ has endured all the way to the cross, all the way to Easter Sunday morning, as we're going to look at this coming Sunday, to see that there is an empty tomb because Christ has conquered. He has dealt with it. The gospel is all about Christ's pain for the sins of his people. Believer, celebrate that love tonight. Good Friday is only good because of the massive amount of love that we see in the cries of agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I would leave you with this, believer. Can you comprehend this love? Can you believe that you are loved to this degree that someone would endure this on your behalf? If you are a Christian tonight, it is true. You are infinitely loved by this Savior in heaven. He has done this on your behalf. And so tonight, let us worship this great Savior for this love. Let us war against this sin that, that ensnares us because Christ has died to free us from that. And let us boldly go into this week and into this life, eagerly pursuing a deeper relationship with this Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father tonight, we pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit would give us an understanding of this cries of agony from this text. Father, we pray that your Spirit would open up our hearts, that we would come to realize how much we are loved by both you and your Son. Father, we pray now that as we hear these words, that your Spirit would build us up. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grip us by the reality of what Christ has done so that we would war against sin and that our hearts would be drawn to love him more and more. We ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.